from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium 2019, brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Welcome back to MIT, everybody. This is The Cube, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante, and I'm here with my co-host, Paul Gillen, this is day two coverage of the MIT CDOIQ conference. A lot of acronyms, it stands for MIT, of course, the great institution, but Chief Data Officer Information Quality event. This is 13th annual event. Lars Tumre is here. He's the managing partner of Brass Rat Capital. Cool name, Lars. <laughs> welcome to theCUBE. Great Thank to have you Thank you very much, on. glad to have so you. So you got, I got to start with the name. Brass Rat Capital, what is Brass that? Brass Rat is a reference to the MIT school MIT. ring. Okay. It's supposed and to be a beaver. Well, it is, but the students call it a brass rat. <laughs> and I'm third generation MIT, so it's just seemed absolutely appropriate that it's a brass rat. It has. And then capital is not a reference to money, but it's actually a reference to the intellectual capital that if you have five or six brass rats in the same company, you know, we sometimes, the engineers arrive and they can do some things. And then boy, if you put in some data, data capital in there, you can really explode. Sometimes we cause a few problems. So we're going to talk about some new regulations that are coming down, new legislation that's coming down that you exposed uh, me to yesterday, which is going to have downstream implications. I mean, if you Drastic. can get ahead of this stuff and understand it, you can really, first of all, prepare, make sure you're in compliance, but then potentially take advantage for your business. So explain to us this notion of Open Government okay. Act. Um, in the last five years, six years or so, there's been an effort going on to increase the transparency upon, across all levels of government, okay? State, local, and federal government. The first of the federal government laws was called the, um, uh, excuse me, Open Data Act of 2014. Right. And that was an act that was enacted unanimously by Congress and signed by Obama that was taking the departments of the various and agencies of the United States government and trying to roll up all the expenses into one kind of expense. This is where we spent our money and who got the money and doing that. That's what they were trying to do. It's a big didn't, picture type of thing, right? Yeah, big picture yeah. type thing, but unfortunately it didn't work, <laughs> okay? Because they forgot to you know, inc include this odd word called ontologies. So the, the same departments meant the same thing. They love data problem, data they quality have a problem. They a real big data problem. <laughs> they still have it. And so there are two GAO reports out criticizing how it was you know, done, and the government's going to try and you know, correct it. Then, in earlier this year, there was another uh, Open Government Data Act, which said, in, it was pat signed by Trump, now this time, it had like maybe 25 negative votes, but essentially otherwise passed Congress completely. And it was called the Open, and it's all capital, O-P-E-N, Government Data Act, okay? And that's not been implemented yet, but there's a lot of talk around this conference today and various um, chief data officers are talking about this requirement that every single non-intelligence defense, you know, vital protection of the people type stuff, all the like um, interior, treasury, transportation, those type of systems, if you produce a report these days, which is machine, re I mean human readable, you must now in two years or three years, I forget the exact implementation date, have it also be machine readable. Now, p some people think machine readable means like PDF formats, but no, in fact, what the government did is it said it must be machine readable, so you must be able to get into the reports and you must be able to extract out the information and attach it to the tree of knowledge, okay? So we're all of a sudden having context, like there are currently machine readable, quote unquote, SEC reports, but you can get into those SEC reports and you pull out the net, net income information and it says it's net income, but you don't know what it attaches to on the tree of knowledge. So um, we are helping the government in some sense enable machine readable type reporting that we can do machine to machine without people being involved. When you say the tree of knowledge, you're talking about the concept. Semantic, that, that semantic tree of knowledge. So that you know, we all come from one concept. Like a, a human is an example of a living thing, a living beast. A living beast is an example of a living thing. So it all sort of goes back, and there's sort of as you get farther and farther out in the tree, there's more distance or semantic distance, but you can attach it back to concepts. So you can attach context to the various data objects. Is this essentially metadata? It's, that's what people call it, but they, if I were to go over to CSAIL here at MIT, they would turn around and they call it the tree of knowledge or semantic data. 
okay? It's referred to as semantic data, so you are passing not only the data itself, but the context that goes along with the data. Okay, so how does this relate to the Financial Transparency Act? Well, the Financial Transparency Act was I introduced by Representative Issa, who's a Republican out of California. He used to run the Governmental Affairs Committee in the House. He retired from Congress this you know, past November. But in 2017, he introduced um, what's called, referred to as H.R. 1530. Yes. Um, and the 1530 is going to dramatically change the way um, financial regulators work in the United States. Um, it, is about, it was about to be introduced two weeks ago when the Libra uh, digital currency stuff came up, so it's been delayed a little bit because they're trying to add some of the digital currency legislation to that law. Trying to front run that. Okay. Well, I don't know exactly yeah. what they, it, remember it's all coming out of Maxine Waters Committee. Yeah. So the staff is working on a bunch of different things at once. But um, we, OMG was asked to consult with them on looking at the 1530 Act and saying how would we um, improve, quote unquote, given our technical, you know, we're not doing policy, we're just talking about the t you know, technical aspects of the Act. How would we want it to see it improved? So one of the things that we have advised is that for the first time in the United States Code's history, they're going to include an interesting term called ontology. You know what ontology is? Well, everyone gets scared by that word. <laughs> and when I re run into people, they say, are you a doctor? I said, no, 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 I'm just a data guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but an ontology is like a taxonomy, right. um, but it ha ha order has importance. And an ontology allows you to do it is a, a kinda, you know, it's, it giving some context of linking something to something else. And so you're able to give more information with an ontology than you're able to with a taxonomy. Okay, so it's like a taxonomy on steroids. Yes, <laughs> e exactly. More, but, flexi but, more yeah. flexible taxonomy. Yeah. It, yes, but it's critically important for artificial intelligence machine learning because if I can give them an ontology of sort of how it goes up and down the semantics, I can t turn around and do uh, AI and machine learning problems on the order of 100,000, even 10,000 times faster. Mm -hmm. and, and it has context. It has context. Yes. And just having a little bit of context speeds up these problems so dramatically so. And it, th is that what enables the machine to machine communications? No, no. Or? The machine to machine is coming in with something called SBRM, which is Standard Business Report Model. It's a OMG specification of a way of allowing the computers, or machines as we call them these days, to get into a standard business report, okay? So let's say you're a drug company, you have to certify you, drugs you manufactured in India get to the United States safely, okay? You have various reporting requirements along the way, you got to give XYZ to FDA, et cetera. That will always be in a standard format. The SEC has a different format, FERC has a different format, okay? So what SBRM does, it allows them to describe in an ontology what's in the report and then it also allows uh, one to attach an ontology to the cells in the report. So if you like had a, uh, an uh, SEC 10Q, 10K report, you can attach a US GAAP taxonomy or ontology to it, and it can say, okay, net income, yeah, I know that's part of the income statement, uh, you should never see that in a balance sheet type item, mm -hmm. you know, as an example, okay? Or you can, for the first time, by having that context, you can say, or solve a problem which has existed, that you can file these machine-readable reports that are wrong. So believe it or not, there have been about 50 cases you know, in the last 10 years where SEC reports have been filed where the assets don't equal total liabilities plus shareholders' equity. You know, just, they didn't add up. <laughs> so this two-entry you know, two accounting doesn't work. Okay, so, so, so you can have the machines go and check at scale and, and, right, check and say, and hey, we got a problem here. We got a problem here and you don't have to get the humans involved. So we're going to, um, Holland and Australia are two of the leaders ahead of the United States in this area. They've seen dramatic pickups. I mean, Holland's reporting something on the order of 90% pickup. Um, Australia's per r reporting 60% pickup. When you say pickup, you're talking about pickup of errors or? Uh, no, efficiency, a productivity. Productivity, okay, Because you're taking people out of the whole cycle. It, it's dramatic. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, now, what's the OMG's role in all this? Well, explain the OMG. Object Management Group, I'm not, I'm not speaking on behalf of them. Uh, it's a um, membership run organization. Well, you're a member. I, mean, I am a member. Co co I, I'm a co-lead lead. of it, but I don't represent Okay. OMG, it's the membership has to collectively vote that this is what we think, okay? So I can't speak on them. Right. I have a pretty significant role with them. I run uh, on behalf of OMG something called the Federated Enterprise Risk Management Group. That's the group which is focusing on risk management for large entities like the federal government's Veterans Affairs or D Department of Defense. Upstairs, I think, talking right now is the Chief Data Officer for Transportation. Okay, he, that's a large organization which they are, they are instructed by OMB at the ch um, chief financial officer level. The one, number one thing to do for the government is to get an effective enterprise risk management model going in the government agencies. And so they come to OMG like, just like NIST or just like uh, DARPA does from the defense or intelligence side saying, we need to have standards in this area so not only can we talk to you effectively, but we can talk wi with our industry partners effectively on space programs, or on retail, on medical programs, or on finance programs. And so there, at OMG, there are two significant financial um, programs or standards that exist. One's called FIGI, for fi Financial Instrument Global Identifier, um, which is a way of identifying a swap. It's a way of identifying a security does not have to be used for a QSIP, but it, uh, worldwide you can identify that a, you know, IBM stock did trade in Tokyo, so it's a different identifier, it has different you know, deliverables against the one trading in New York, okay? So those are called FIGI identifiers. Then um, there are attributes associated with that security or that beast that is being identified, which is generally comes out of FIBO, which is the Financial Industry Business Ontology. So, you know, it says for a corporate bond, it has coupon maturity, semi-annual payment, bullets, you know, as an example. So that gives you all the information that you would need to go through and do the calculation, assuming you could, you know, had a, a calculation routine to do it. Then you need to ne then turn around and turn, you know, set up your, what I'll call your environment. You know, where forward yield curves are with mortgage-back securities or any puttable callable bond, and you're going to sort of probabilistically run their numbers many times and you come up with effective duration. Um, and then you do your various analytics, sort of, you know, aggregating the portfolio and looking at shortfalls versus your funding or however you're doing risk management on it. And then finally you do reporting, which is where the standardized business reporting model comes in. So those are kind of the five parts of doing a full enterprise risk model analytics. So what does this mean, for, first of all, who does this impact and what does it mean for organizations? Well, it's going to change the world for basically everyone. Because it's like doing a equivalent of a software upgrade from version one to version 2.0. And you know how software upgrades, everyone hates <laughs> and it hurts. Because everyone's going to have to now start using the same standard ontology, and of course that standard ontology no one completely agrees with. Right. The regulators haven't agreed to it, the, uh, and the ultimate controlling authority in this thing is going to be FSOC, which is the uh, Dodd-Frank mandated response to not ever having another TARP. So the Secretary of Treasury heads it. It's a, I forget, it's the Fed, uh, Federal Systemic Oversight Committee or something like that. All eight regulators report into it, and OFR stands as being the advisor to FSOC for all the analytics. Um, what these laws are doing are they're giving o OFR more and more power to turn around and look at how are we going to find data across the industry so we can come up with consistent analytics, and we can therefore hopefully take one day like Goldman Sachs's prepayment model on mortgages and apply it to the Citibank portfolio so we can look at consistency of analytics as well. Will this only apply to regulated businesses? It's going to apply to regulated financial businesses, okay? So it's going to capture all your mutual funds, it's going to capture all your investment advisors, it's going to capture most of your um, insurance companies um, through the medical era side, it's going to capture all your um, commercial banks, it's going to capture most of your community banks. Okay, not all of them, because some of them are so small, they're not regulated on a federal basis. The one regulator which is um, 
being skipped at this point or is the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, but they're apparently coming along as well, independent of the federal legislation. Remember, they're regulated on the state level, not regulated on the federal level. But they've kind of realized where the ball's going. Mm -hmm. and Will this make life better or simply more complex? It's going to make life horrible at first, but we're going to take out incredible pr um, efficiency gains probably after the first time you get it done. Okay? Is it going to be the problem of getting it done to everyone agreeing we're using the same definitions and for who, the same data? who gets the efficiency gains? The regulators, the companies, or both? All, everyone. Can you imagine that you know, um, a Goldman Sachs earnings report comes out and you're an analyst looking at, you know, how do I know what Goldman did good or bad? You have your own equity model, you just give the model to the, the semantic worksheet and it'll turn around and say, oh, these numbers were all good, this is what we expected, da, 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 da. Mm. and you, haven't, mm. you, you can do that. There are examples of companies here in the United States where they used to have um, competitive analysis. Okay? They would be taking somewhere on the order of 600 to 700 man hours to do the competitive analysis. By having it available electronically, they cut those 600 hours down to five minutes to do a competitive analysis, okay? That's an example of the type of productivity you're going right. to see both on the investment side when you're doing analysis, but also on the regulatory side. Can you now imagine you get a regulatory report and say, oh, they're, they're, out of, they're way out of whack. I can tell you there's fraud going on here because their numbers are too much in X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. have to fudge the numbers to... And so the securities analyst can spend more of his or her time looking forward, doing forecasts, doing exactly. analysis, than having to look back and reconcile all these uh, Right, deltas. and you, know, we, you hear at this, this conference, for instance, something like 80 to 85% of the time of analysts is spent getting the data ready. Yeah, well, you hear the same thing with data scientists. Right, and, and, and you know, so to the extent that we can help define the d data, we're going to speed things up dramatically. But then what's really interesting to me being an MIT engineer is that we have great possibilities in AI. I mean, really great possibilities. Right now, most of the AI models are pattern matching. Like, you know, this idea of using face field technology, that's just really doing patterns. You can do wonderful predictive analytics out of AI, and, but we just need to give a lot of the AI, AI models the context so they can run more quickly, mm -hmm. okay? So we're going to see a world which is going to sound funny, but um, we're going to see a world where we talk about semantic analytics, okay? And semantic analytics means that I'm giving all the inputs for the analysis with context to each one of the variables. And, when I, and what comes out of it will be a variable or a result, which will also have semantics with it. So one, in the future, not too distant future, we're, also, we're in some of the national labs, we're already doing it, you're doing pipelines of one model goes to the next model, goes to the next model, and it goes to the next model. So you can, you're going to get software pipelines. Believe it or not, you can get them running out of an Excel spreadsheet, you know, or the modern enhanced Excel spreadsheet. And that's where the future is going to be. So you really, if you're going to be really good in this business, you're going to have to be able to use your brain you're going to have to understand what data means. You're going to have to figure out what you know, modeling really means. What happens if we look, you know, normally for a lot of this stuff we do um, bell curves, okay? Well, that doesn't have to be the only distribution. You can do fat tails. So if you did fat tail distribution instead of a bell curve, oh, it gives you much different results. Now, which one's better? I don't know. But, you know, I'm just using an example. It's another cut in the data. So, or view. Uh, now, talk about more about the tech behind this. You mentioned AI. I mean, we're talking about math machine learning, deep learning, yeah, um, add some color to that. Well, the tech behind it is, believe it or not, some relatively old tech. There's a technology called RDF, which is kind of, yeah, it's sure. been around for a long time. It's a science, kind of a machine learning, not machine learning, I'm sorry, machine code type, fairly simplistic definitions, lots of angle brackets and all this stuff. There was a higher level of that was extracted, I think put into a standard in like 2004, 2005 called OWL 2.0. And it does a lot at a higher level, the same stuff that RDF does, okay? You can also create, um, believe it or not, your own special ways of, of a, a communicating an ontology just using XML, okay? So uh, XBRL is an enhanced version of XML, mm -hmm. okay? And so some of these older technologies um, 
quote unquote old, you know, 20 years old, are essentially going to be driving a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, Corba, right? Corba mm -hmm. is the what's a made OMG, you know, on the yeah. you know, communication right. across the thing. Do you realize that basically every single device in the world has a Corba standard in it? Okay, yeah. OMG standard is in all your smartphones and all your computers, that and, makes sense. and that's how they communicate. It turns out that a lot of this old stuff, quote unquote, is so rigidly well defined, well done, that you can build modern stuff that takes us to the Mars mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on these old standards. All right, we got to go, but I got to give you the award for the most acronyms. So we, got, <laughs> we got HR1530, FIGI, OMG, SBRM, FSOC, TARP, OFR, RDF, well, we knew that. OWL, XML, XBRL, CORBA, which we of course knew, but that's well done. <laughs> yeah. Lars, thanks so much for coming Thank on the queue. It's great to have you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest from MIT, CDOIQ, right after this brief, a short brief, a short message. Thank you. <laughs> Stop.